So, the, as I said, I've got a, an, about an hour to talk uh, on this topic, and that's quite unusual um, to be able to really uh, focus in on a, on a technical topic for, uh, for such a long duration. Normally, people like me are, are cut short at 20 minutes, so hopefully we can, uh, we can get beyond that and we can really dig into this topic um, in a little bit more detail. Uh, I first started um, working on timber structures when I was um, at, uh, at Ovarican Partners um, and was involved uh, with timber structures there. And then my, my involvement um, continued when I was at the University of Queensland. So I was working on uh, medium scale and large scale testing on, uh, on timber structures. And then it's continued now that I'm back in the UK at the University of Edinburgh, the research group that, that we have there. And we're, we're doing a, uh, work there as, as we speak. Um, and I guess maybe, um, like me, you, you may have seen uh, some presentations on, uh, on timber construction. This is uh, Michael Green, and uh, he gave a talk back in 2013 to, to the TED conference, which was you know, really inspirational. He, gave a, um, he presented, if you like, a, a vision of, um, of tall timber urbanism, this idea that we could make skyscrapers out of, uh, out of timber, out of CLT. Um, and this would pave the way to solving you know, the housing crisis and uh, climate change issues and all of these kind of things. Um, and you know, I kind of came across that talk at about the same time I was starting to work on uh, timber and, as I say, found it very inspirational. And I think you know, it wasn't just me. I think it captured, if you like, the imagination of, the, um, of a number of people in the industry as well. Um, and was also picked up, I think, uh, by the media, particularly in, in the last couple of years. And so... But it wasn't just Michael Green. There's, you know, other uh, architects, visionary people around the world sort of thinking about these kind of issues. Um, and it, that, again, is being sort of picked up, I suppose, at a level above the technical. Uh, it's being picked up uh, at, a, at a media level. So this was um, something that uh, appeared in, uh, in The Economist. Our view is that all buildings should be made of timber. We think that we should be looking at concrete and steel, like you look at petrol and diesel. And so, I mean, I think these are really powerful ideas. Um, and, I, and, I, and as I say, they're, they're, they're quite inspiring. They capture um, the, the imagination. They make people want to uh, maybe engage with these, uh, these kind of buildings. And what I think is important to understand is that, you know, there's this vision that is presented of, you know, tall timber, timber skyscrapers. Um, and underneath that vision, you've got, you know, a series of, of specialist disciplines, um, all pushing in the same direction uh, to try and, uh, and make these things happen. Um, and each one of those is, is needed in order to get one of these, uh, these projects over the line. And I guess also since I've, been, uh, since I've been working in this area, we've gone from a situation, I think, where we had you know, a, a few, if you like, signature projects of, of tall timber uh, to a situation where we now have actually quite a large number uh, of projects, and it's really taken off over the course of the last uh, couple of years. And um, I guess many of you will be familiar with uh, this building, which is the, the, the Tallwood House um, at Brock Commons um, in, uh, in Canada. Uh, it featured in the Ice Truck Tea um, uh, late last year uh, as an example of this kind of, uh, of, this kind of construction. And I suppose, for me, this, this, this building really represents a transition, if you like. It, it represents a, a transition from a, a vision of, of tall timber to really uh, a reality uh, of tall timber. And all of those specialist disciplines lined up uh, pushing in that direction to deliver, uh, to deliver something like this. But it's not just over in the United States, of course. You know, we've, got, uh, we've got big buildings being built in the, in the UK as well. Um, and we can, uh, we can look around us in, in London and see, see many of those structures. And when I sort of think about um, this, this vision uh, that is presented uh, by these uh, you know, visionary architects and designers, I kind of I think of all these specialist disciplines, and then I, I reflect, and I think, well, I think that the, the visionary designer pushing in that direction is in quite a vulnerable position. Um, and, and they're vulnerable because I think they're vulnerable to, to being told what they want to hear. Um, and so all of these specialist disciplines are lined up. Um, and if just one of those fails to deliver on their end of the bargain, then they say, actually, 
I can't make this work for you, um, then the whole gambit is off. Uh, the, the dream, if you like, it remains a dream. We don't get to that uh, reality. And I, and I think that puts uh, the design in a really vulnerable pos uh, position because, you know, if presented with five different um, engineers, four of whom say, I'm not sure I can make that work for you, but one of whom says, oh, I can do it, of course they're going to be tempted to, to pick the one who says they can make it work. And so what I wanted to do today um, was not to think about the, that vision, although we started there, because that's not my bag. Um, and I'm not going to sort of look at all of these uh, specialist disciplines. I'm just going to look at the one that I n know a little bit about, uh, which is fire safety engineering. Um, and so what I want to do is I want to dig in a little bit into the, into the technical. Um, and I also wanted to think a little bit, actually, about the legal um, and our duties as professional engineers and our responsibilities. So whenever I start thinking about uh, the legal, I always go back uh, to, the, uh, to the Building Act in uh, 1984. Uh, this is the, I think, the coat of arms for the, uh, for the uh, UK government. It's got the, the lion and the unicorn there. And what the Building Act 1984 does is it uh, enables the creation of the building regulations um, and all of the functional requirements that sit within the building regulations. And it also gives the Secretary of State the power to create approved documents um, that can provide some practical guidance uh, as to how to achieve the requirements of the building regulations. So it creates those approved documents. And so when we talk about, <coughs> excuse me, when we talk about uh, all the approved document series, this is where uh, this is where they come from. And of course, we know these are these are documents that are currently under review because the the body that issues those uh, at the moment is uh, the MHCLG, uh, Ministry of Housing Communities and Local Government. Um, and so the Building Act allows the creation of these documents. But the Building Act also does something else uh, as well. What it does is it creates, is it tells us how we can use those documents and the status that those documents have uh, within, within the industry. And so what, uh, what it tells us is that you don't have to follow the approved document in order to meet the requirements of the, uh, the building regulations, in order to meet those functional requirements. You don't have to follow the approved documents. You can go uh, by whatever route you want, but what it does say is that if you do follow the approved documents, then that means that if something goes wrong in your building or if somebody challenges the way that you made your design, that means that you, can, you will be assumed to be, if you like, innocent until somebody else can prove you guilty. Um, conversely, if you, if you don't do what it says in the approved documents, so if you, if you found your own way to meet the functional requirements, it will be assumed that you are guilty until somebody else can, uh, until you can demonstrate uh, that actually what you did was appropriate. Now, of course, I'm paraphrasing this. It's all in, it's all in legal terms, um, in terms of uh, relied upon to tending uh, to establish uh, liability. Uh, but that's the essence of it. Um, and so I suppose the point out of this and the point that I wanted to make um, is that a failure to comply with the approved document, in this case approved document B, uh, may be relied upon as tending to establish your liability. So let's take a look then at, at the approved document. Um, and so, you know, engineers like to dive straight into the, into the detail of these kind of documents, but it's always worth looking at the, at the front matter. Uh, and this is what it says right at the start uh, of, of approved document B. Um, and it says that the, the approved documents are intended to provide guidance for some of the more common building situations. And so what we've got there, sitting within the, 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 the front matter of the approved document, is a limitation on scope. If your building is strange or unusual, a little bit weird, uh, then you can't assume that the guidance in the approved document is appropriate for your building situation. 
it's out of scope. And so this got me, you know, thinking a little bit because one of the one of the things that you know I see in the uh, in the, the vision that, that is presented is this uh, idea that you know we're going to build uh, you know taller and bigger, uh, and all of these kind of superlatives um, keep on coming. There's a race to build in tall timber, uh, and I think to myself, well, if we have the world's largest CLT buildings or the tallest or whatever you want to call it, is that really a more common type of building situation? By definition, it's the largest, it's exceptional. So can I immediately assume that the approved document applies? I'm not saying it doesn't, but can I make that assumption? Because this, to me, raises a question. And so I started thinking about this, um, about you know, whether these kinds of buildings are the more common uh, type of building situation. Um, because you know, for out of scope buildings, you know, the, de the design team cannot assume that ADB applies. And if they do, it will tend to establish their liability. So it doesn't mean it can't be done. It just means that the functional requirements of the building regulations need to be addressed directly. So what I wanted to do now, uh, and you know, having set, if you like, the legal context, um, is to think a little bit about you know, the technical. Now, I could talk about fire spread from building to building. I could talk about vertical fire spread on the outside of a building, uh, floor to floor. Um, but given the setting, um, I thought I would focus in on structure and think just about the structure. So, I mean, I'm a fire safety engineer, and I spend a lot of time thinking about fire safety problems, but I don't know the complexion of the audience uh, 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 here, so it's worth just refreshing our, uh, our memories of what happens uh, when we have a fire. So if we have an axis of time along the bottom, and some axis uh, up the side, maybe gas temperature, for example, a fire starts, not a lot happens at the, at the start, uh, and then gradually it grows, and at some point, it will grow to a point where it maybe flashes over. This is a compartment fire I'm talking about. So it flashes over, uh, and then we have uh, a fully involved or fully developed uh, fire. That will last for a certain period of time, consuming the fuel load that's in, uh, in the compartment. So, for example, the furniture. And then the fuel load will burn out, it will be consumed, we won't have any left, uh, and the fire will decay. And so that's, you know, broadly speaking, what happens in a, in a compartment fire. So if we think about then addressing directly the functional requirement, what is, the, what is going on here? Uh, if we look at internal fire spread structure, so B3 of the building regulations, uh, the, the building shall be designed and constructed so that in the event of fire, its stability will be maintained for a reasonable period. <laughs> And then the question, of course, is, well, what do you mean by reasonable? Uh, immediately follows. So given that I'm now asking this question, I'm asking this question, are the, is, is an exceptional building in scope or is it, is it out of scope? And if I want to meet that functional requirement, if I want to address it directly to check, I need to answer somehow this question of what is reasonable. So I can do that in a couple of ways. Um, I can go from first principles and build it all the way up, or I can try and figure out what actually the guidance in the various documents was trying to achieve in the first place. Or maybe I could do both. Right. But if I take that second route, if I try and understand what is the background here, where I wind up, after a little bit of looking, I get to the post-war building studies, fire gradings of buildings. Uh, and this is a you know, piece of work published in 1946. Everyone realized they were going to need to a lot of rebuilding after the Second World War, so a lot of work uh, went into these documents. And if I go and look in, in that document, what I find is the initial basis for fire resistance requirements for structures within the United Kingdom. Um, and what they realized was that, well, actually, what we want to happen is that we want a structure to be able to resist the fire, and we want it to be able to go 
through that fire until there's no fuel left and we want the structure still to be standing there. And so paragraph 55, we come along and we see this word burnout featuring. So we need to have complete burnout without collapse. What they also realize is that buildings are a little bit different from, from one another. Um, and so they realized that if there was a small amount of fuel, then they needed less fire resistance than if there was a large amount of fuel. So they said for buildings where there is a smaller fuel load, we'll only have one hour uh, fire resistance, whereas for buildings that have a larger fuel load, we're going to have four hours, and so on and so forth. And so this idea of burnout is embedded right at the beginning uh, of, of our uh, building regulation system. Um, and if we think about that in the context of, of the, the fire that I showed you uh, a few moments ago, then they were, weren't thinking about this in terms of a fire that looks like this. They were thinking about it in terms of the standard fire. And so, but they realized that the standard fire, it doesn't look like a real fire, and so they made some correlation between the two. But ultimately, what they wanted to do was make sure that this lasted longer than the burnout, uh, than the fire that they were expecting in their buildings. Now, if you try and trace all of the, the fire resistance periods that you find in today's uh, approved document B, uh, all the way back, it's lots of uh, committees and decisions and, uh, and risk factors going into it, and I'm not going to try and address all of that today. Um, but at some point, we wind up uh, in, the, uh, in the appendix uh, of approved document B uh, with table A2, which gives us our minimum periods of fire resistance. Uh, and so you can see what we've got there is we've got an indication of the height of the building and the type of the building. Uh, and then you go and you look it up. So I imagine, you know, if, uh, if you're a structural engineer, uh, an architect, this is the kind of thing uh, you might do. You might know how tall your building was. You might know what it was supposed to be used for. So you go to the table, you look it up, you pick the 90 minutes, and then if you're a structural engineer, what you would then do if you were designing, for example, a concrete building, what you might do is you might uh, go to Eurocode 2, uh, you go into the fire bit, you go down and you find the, the tabulated data, and then you say, okay, well, I need to have, for example, 90 minutes of fire resistance, so therefore I need this many millimeters of cover, and there might be some minimum dimensions on the element, depending on which element you were designing. And so that would be the way to go about the fire design of the structure. Uh, so the, the values at the right-hand side of this table are aiming to resist a burnout of the fuel load, um, and then you go and you look up the tabulated uh, values. Now, that's quite an important idea, this idea of burnout. Uh, because if we have a burnout, it allows us to start doing certain things with our buildings. Because we can assume that the structure is going to remain stable actually for an indefinite period. It's never going to come down. So what that allows us to do as engineers is it allows us to say, well, now I can have a prolonged evacuation period within my building because I don't need to worry about how long the building is going to resist a fire. People can spend a long time getting out of my building because I know the building is going to be OK. And I can then have what's known as the stay put strategy. So I can, if I'm confident that my building is going to remain stable, I can create a strategy whereby I I, just, I leave people in their flats or in their apartments during the fire, and they're going to remain safe. Now, of course, we know that we don't just need the structure to deliver on that case. We need to prevent the fire from spreading as well. And lastly, there's the question of firefighter safety. Um, and so if we have a, a low-rise building, then the fire service can fight the fire from the outside. But if we have a high-rise building, then the fire service, if they want to fight the fire, they're going to need to go in. Uh, and if they're going into the building, they want to have some assurance that the building is not going to fall down. And the concept of burnout gives us that assurance. Now, don't get me wrong, the fire service is still putting themselves at risk to go and tackle the fire. But the principle being that they should be able to fall back within the building to a relative place of safety and ultimately fall back out, outside of the building uh, if they wish to. So we've got these three different things that we are getting from the idea that we are designing our structures to resist a burnout. Prolonged evacuation, stay put, and firefighter safety. And if you think about tall buildings, these are the, the underlying tenets of our design strategies for these buildings. 
And then I see a building like this. And there's a lot, uh, there's a lot of timber there. And so I start to ask then the question, well, what happens in a building which has timber? Because timber, we know, burns. So do I get this situation? Does the timber just burn out when the fuel load and the furniture is consumed? Or does it continue to burn until there's no fuel load left, until the structure has been consumed and we have some kind of failure? Or actually, do I get maybe something in between? And this is something we've observed in, in large-scale testing, where you get a decay and then, then, it, uh, then it grows again and then you get a decay, you get a cyclic burning. Which one of these am I going to have? Because if I have continued burning within my structure, I can no longer guarantee that the structure is going to remain safe, remain stable, excuse me, and I no longer can therefore support within my building a prolonged evacuation period. I can't tell people to stay within their, uh, within their apartments if I don't believe the structure is going to remain stable. And I can't guarantee firefighter safety, so I need to change the way uh, the firefighters fight the fire. Now, this is not new. This is not new news. Um, because if you go to the post-war building studies, they knew all of this. And they realized that if they had elements of combustible structure, then that might continue to burn. So what they did is they said that the structure for these types that they wanted to resist a burnout should be of incombustible material. So again, going back to the root of where the guidance come from, comes from, it's not intended for combustible construction. And again, if we think then, we've been on this little, this, you know, this little um, loop, if you like, started asking the question because we realized something is not very common or it's unusual. But then when we start thinking about it, we realize, well, actually it's any combustible material, not just the unusual ones. And so, again, we come back to that. If we start to think about applying that guidance, applying the guidance in table A2 of the building, uh, of approved document B, we cannot assume that ADB applies. And if the design team do, this will tend to establish their liability. So, what do we do? Well, one thing we can do is we can avoid the problem. And so the first solution, because I don't just want to present to you this evening on these are, these are the issues, these are the problems, I also want to provide some level of, uh, of solution. The, the first solution here is very simple. We avoid the problem, but we make sure that the timber does not get involved in the fire, it doesn't burn, and we do that by encapsulating the timber. And if we do that, then we've, we've prevented that feedback loop and we can now guarantee that we have that burnout that we need to support our prolonged evacuation, our stay put, and our firefighter safety. Now, again, this is not new news. I claim no, no credit for on this. Um, so if we look, uh, this is some work that was done um, uh, in the United States um, by NIS and NRC. So they did a, a large research uh, project where they built some compartments out of uh, CLT. This is it under construction. And uh, thanks to um, Joseph uh, and, and Matt Haler from uh, NIST for providing me with these, uh, these high quality images. And so this is the compartment getting built. And they actually built two compartments side by side. And they ran a whole series of experiments uh, in these. And these reports are free to download. You can uh, go and have a look at them uh, for yourself. And what they did is they created a, uh, a compartment that was fully encapsulated. <coughs> Um, and so you can see on the, on the walls there, you've got, uh, you've got plasterboard linings, um, and then we've also got the fuel load in the, in the compartment. Um, so some kind of representative fuel load. And I think they used on these experiments, they used a, a buildup of three layers of plasterboard on the surface of the CLT. Then they, they lit the fire, and then the fire burnt out, and they went back in and had a look. Now, obviously, you can see it's a little bit of a mess um, after the fire. But importantly, a, a lot of the, uh, the plasterboard has remained in place, uh, although there's, notably there's some 
on the floor there. Now, when they went in and they cleaned this compartment up, they took off the remaining plasterboard, and what they found was a structure underneath that was essentially as good as new. And so, if we're thinking about solutions to this problem, if we want to build with CLT, if we encapsulate it, and, and we encapsulate it effectively, then we can wind up with something like this um, after what is a pretty severe fire. So let's take a, a little bit more of a closer look at that then. Um, and so this is the, this is the build up um, that they had. So this is not to scale. Um, but we've got the CLT there, and then we've got the three layers of plasterboard over. And what they did is they, they inserted firmacouples um, between uh, the layers of plasterboard on the surface of the CLT, and then in depth in the CLT. And so if we look at this, if we look at the, the results of that data, and as I say, you can download all of this from, uh, from this uh, website. Um, we've got time along the bottom. We've got temperature up the side. And if I plot the data, <coughs> the black line there, that's the average gas temperature in the compartment, so obviously it gets very hot. The first of those red lines, the top one, that's the, the, the temperature at the first layer of plasterboard, or at the back of the first layer, if you like. And obviously that gets pretty hot as well, up to 600. But as we go deeper, as we go deeper into that plasterboard into layer two and then the surface of the CLT, you'll see the surface of the CLT doesn't really go above 100 Celsius. It stays pretty cool uh, by comparison to the outside. And then slightly deeper within the CLT, we're not even uh, getting close to 100 Celsius in there. And so I suppose I'm putting this up because it demonstrates that this, this kind of solution can absolutely work. Um, it can absolutely keep the, the, uh, the, the surface of that CLT cool uh, and cool enough that it doesn't get involved in the fire. It doesn't start contributing, at which point I don't need to worry about that question of does my fire does my structure continue to burn or does it go out because it was never burning in the first place? Now, then the question comes, well, okay, but how cold? How cold do you need the surface of my structure to be? Um, and if we want to answer that question, we can go and look um, at what happens if we, take a, if we take a little piece of timber and we put it uh, and we do thermogravimetric analysis on it. And what that means is that if we've got the graph on the left-hand side here, we've got temperature along the bottom. So Thermogravimetric analysis, you take a little sample of the timber, you put it in, and it's essentially an oven. You just heat it gradually, and you measure the mass. Uh, and that means you can see how it's reacting. Because it's the reactions, it's the pyrolysis gas coming off that timber that is the thing that can burn. So it's only once the material starts pyrolyzing that we start uh, to be able to contribute to the fire. So if I plot that data, um, it looks a little bit like this. Um, and so if we look at that, if we break that down, Got the, the first bit up there, that's the timber drying as it goes up to about 100 Celsius. So we just lose all of the, the water in the, in the timber. And then nothing happens then for a bit between 100 Celsius and 200 Celsius. It just kind of sits there. And then at about 200 Celsius, we start to get this curve that drops off. Now, what that is, is that's your pyrolysis happening. That's the, the timber starting to gasify, and those gases can burn. Um, so this is the important bit because this is where the fuel, if you like, starts to be able to enter into our fire. And then the bit at the end here, that's char oxidation. Um, we don't need to worry about that, I think, for the purposes of this. The important bit there is the, is the middle, the, the pyrolysis. So if we want to prevent our timber getting involved in the fire, then we simply need to keep the surface, we need to prevent that pyrolysis from happening, and we need to keep the surface of that timber below around 200 Celsius. And if we do that, we can be very clear that we've prevented the pyrolysis from happening. The timber is not contributing. Now, when I start talking about like thermogravimetric analysis and all of these kind of things, I often get people say to me, uh, well, Angus, you know, this is, this is all well and good, but isn't this, isn't this all a little bit academic? Uh, and my answer to that question is no. No, I don't think this is a little bit academic. Because if we go and look at the standards uh, that already exist within the industry, so if we go and look at 13501 Part 2, uh, it's a fire classification of construction products and building elements published by BSI. If you go and read that, what you'll find is the performance uh, characteristics for, uh, for fire testing. And you'll see what is hopefully familiar. You'll see R, E, and I. 
R is the load bearing capacity. You want to make sure the structure retains enough strength to carry the applied load. E is the integrity. You want to make sure that hot smoke and gas don't pass through the structure because you want to maintain maybe tenable conditions on the other side of a wall. I is thermal insulation. You want to keep the unexposed side of, a, uh, of an element cool so that maybe it doesn't start to fire elsewhere in the building. And again, the tenability. Now, if we keep on going in this document, we get to K, uh, fire protection ability. And the fire protection ability is defined here. It says fire protection ability K is the ability of a, a wall or ceiling covering to provide for the material behind the covering protection against ignition, charring, and other damage for a specified period of time. So it's here in the guidance, uh, in, the, in the standards, I should say. And if you go and look at you know, uh, manufacturers' guidance on these kind of things, they, they, they pull out this and they, they point at it. So if we want to build with CLT structures and we want to avoid that question of whether or not our timber gets involved, whether or not we, have, uh, we need to worry about that burnout, if we want to guarantee it, then it's very simple. We avoid the problem by encapsulating. We classify our elements, not just R, E, I, but K as well. And we make sure the acceptance for K is 200 Celsius. Because then you're guaranteeing your timber does not come involved. So I presented that as a solution. And then the question, I suppose, is, well, why is the title of my talk, We Need to Talk About Timber? And it's because I keep on hearing things and seeing things like this. We know that uh, putting plasterboard on the uh, outside of the timber protects it for a certain amount of time. After that, the, the timber will char, it will burn, but it burns at a predictable rate, and there's enough structure left to support the load and to satisfy the fire requirements within the set. So what we have there is a suggestion that we put plasterboard on, but at some point the plasterboard falls off and our timber starts to burn. At which point we go back to the question. Does my compartment stop burning? Does it decay? Does it go out? Or does it continue to burn? And if we're going to allow the structure to participate in the fire, then we have to answer this question. Now, that's one reason why I'm interested in this problem. But the other reason is because there is a design aspiration to expose the CLT. It looks fantastic. It absolutely does. So if we want to expose the CLT so we can enjoy the aesthetic properties, then we also need to answer this question because we're not going to cover it with plasterboard. And so the guys at NIST and NRC, they, they ran more compartment fire uh, experiments. So this was one of their subsequent uh, tests. And what you can see here is you've got a ceiling of CLT. Uh, you've got a wall on the left-hand side of CLT. And then the other two walls there, they've got a similar encapsulation to what we are looking at before. And you can see there's a fuel load again. Now, the outcome from this fire test was a little bit different. So what you can see there is obviously the charred timber where it was exposed on the left and at the back of the compartment. But you can also see that, so on the left and the ceiling of the compartment, I should say. But you can also see at the back and on the right-hand side, we've got the plasterboard has fallen off and the timber there has also become involved within the, within the fire. And of course, uh, this is a, a case where the, the structure failed and the, the test was terminated by extinction, manual intervention. So if we want to start building structures that look like this or structures where the plasterboard is going to fall away at some point during the fire, and we want to maintain a prolonged evacuation period, a stay put strategy, or we want to guarantee firefighter safety, then we need to be able to address this problem. And so let's look at it uh, a little bit. Um, so here we've got uh, just a schematic of a, of a compartment fire. And what you've got there is that during the main part of the, the fire, during the, the start of the fire where we still have the furniture left in the room, everything is involved. The timber is burning with some exposed CLT here, and you've got the furniture burning. But then at some point, the, 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 the fuel load will be exhausted 
from the, from the furniture. And we're just going to wind up with the exposed CLT. And so the fire is going to change a little bit. And so the question then is, does this continue to burn or does this go out? And to answer that question, we need to understand a little bit about the interaction here. Because it's the feedback to the timber that keeps it burning. Timber doesn't burn if it doesn't have uh, a heat source uh, putting energy towards it. And so it's the feedback between the timber, between the flame that's formed at the front of the timber and the timber itself, and between the rest of the compartment at the timber and the timber that is going to determine whether or not this will tend to decay or whether or not this will tend to continue to burn. And so we can start to think about that and we can start to understand what is going on here because we know we've got the timber burning and we know how much there is and so we know something about how much energy is being released in the compartment. And so if we want to think about this, if we want to solve this problem, what we need to do is we need to be able to solve what's called the energy balance. So I know how much energy is being produced. I need to know how much energy I'm losing outside of my compartment and how much of it is going to feed back into the timber to keep the fire burning. Because if that drops low enough, if the amount of energy going back into my timber drops low enough, then my compartment will go out. And so where does the energy go? Well, we have heat being, uh, energy being released inside the compartment, but I have openings on my compartment. I have windows. And you know, if you stand in front of a compartment fire, it's hot. You've got radiation coming out. So we're losing huge amounts of energy due to radiation from the openings of the compartment. We've got maybe openings, and we've got hot smoke and gas leaving through those openings. So they're taking with them energy as they go. Um, so we're losing energy like that as well. We're also actually losing energy into the walls of the structure as well. Um, uh, depending on uh, how big, the, uh, where those are and what their, what their dimensions are. And so we've got uh, the various terms of our energy balance here. Uh, and we can start to build those up a little bit. Uh, and we can start to, to rearrange that. And what we can see is I've put in the feedback is a function of the amount of energy that we're releasing in the compartment minus all of those losses. And if we divide that by the area of the walls, then we can come up with an indicative feedback per unit area onto the surface of our CLT. Now, if that number drops low enough, then our compartment, our CLT will go out. If it stays too high, it will continue to burn, in which case we can't support that prolonged evacuation, the stay put policy, or firefighter safety. So it becomes really important that we have an understanding of what, these, of what these terms are. But then the question, of course, comes again. Well, how low does that number need to go? What's my threshold? And if we want to understand what the threshold is for, uh, for the extinction of timber, then we need to start to understand not the energy balance of the, the compartment, but we need to understand the energy balance on an individual piece of timber. And we, again, we can build that up. Uh, and so if we do that, it looks something uh, a little bit like this. And so you've got the, the ambient fluxes, you've got the, the various losses from the, uh, from the system out the back. I'm not going to go through it all because it's, it's not important to go through the detail here. But you can see the various terms of the equation. The important thing to note is that these two terms here, the, the exposure and then the feedback from the flame, they feed back. They, they go into that equation on the left-hand side, and they are the feedback to, uh, that is going to keep the fire burning or allow it to go out. So if we understand both parts of this equation, both the large-scale, uh, full-scale compartment and also the, the energy balance on a single piece of timber, then we can answer the question. We can say, what are the losses? Um, how quickly is my compartment going to lose energy? And we can also say, how much do I need it to lose in order for me to be able to, for the timber to then extinguish? Now, you know, this all gets a little, bit, uh, a little bit involved, but if we look at this, we, as designers, have got an enormous amount of control over quite a lot of the parameters. These aren't parameters that are given to us. Some of them are. Some of them are just the properties of the timber uh, you know, and, the, and the laws of physics. But we have 
a lot of control over each of these parameters. So if I want to maximize the amount of energy I lose from my compartment through radiation, well then I need to make sure my openings are nice and big because there's going to be greater losses. If I want to make sure that I maximize the amount of energy I'm losing due to convection, so the hot smoke and gas leaving the compartment, then I can maybe arrange my openings in a certain way in order to promote losses in that way. And equally, you know, the, the, the configuration or the materials in my walls will have some impact on the losses from the compartment. So I can control each of those things. And as designers, we can manipulate our designs to allow us to change those parameters to promote the losses. But I can also change a little bit what is the amount of energy released in my compartment. And so I can say, well, you know, if I have less timber exposed, then there's going to be less energy there in the first place. So this left-hand term becomes a little bit smaller, the right-hand terms can become bigger, and if I get the balance right, then I can deliver my compartment to extinction using an understanding of these kind of principles. Now again, this is the kind of point where people say to me, you know, Angus, this is, this is all a little bit, a little bit academic. Um, and my answer to that question is yes. Yes, it is a little bit academic, because if you ask me to define exactly each of those parameters, I can't do that. I can tell you which ones are important. I can tell you how to manipulate the compartment in a direction towards extinction. But I don't know what the cutoffs are on any of these. I don't know how big you need your opening. I don't need know how much timber. I don't have answers to those questions. So I know the principles of it. But these are things that we don't yet know. So is it a bit academic? Yes. It is a little bit academic. Because something I keep on hearing is that charring rate is predictable. Well, yes, it is in a certain way. But I'm not really interested here in my charring rate. I'm interested in when the, the timber goes out. I'm interested in extinction. And extinction is not yet predictable, reliable. So, I started off, I presented you one solution. So avoid the problem by encapsulating your timber. So then if we're going to have a solution that actually the plaster wall falls away, or I want to leave my walls exposed because I, like, I want to have that design aesthetic, then I need to deal with the question of does my compartment continue to burn or does it go out? Because if it continues to burn, as I say, I cannot support my prolonged evacuation, my stay put, or my firefighter safety. And so, what are the solutions here? So, solution, you know, option one, if you like, do the work and solve the energy balance. Because then we can predict when this will happen, when this won't happen. Option two is to test every single configuration that you can conceive of with respect to the geometry, with respect to the openings, with respect to the layup of your CLT, and demonstrate on a case-by-case on a -case basis that your compartment delivers extinction because that then becomes a robust basis to demonstrate that the burnout is achieved. Now, the reality is the way to solve this problem is probably some kind of combination of those two things. Know enough of the energy balance to be able to solve some of it and do testing in order to be able to uh, substantiate that and use those two things together, together to deliver ourselves to a point where we can be confident without having to test absolutely every configuration. So there's three solutions for you. I want to now go on uh, and look at something, the, the next thing, if you like. So imagine we do that successfully. Imagine we manage to, we, we, we demonstrate that the compartment goes out or uh, by testing, or we manage to demonstrate it uh, by solving the energy balance. We've got the decay phase. Okay? So we've guaranteed that we're going to burn out our compartment now let's think about how the structure copes with the fire. So again, this is our scenario. We've got the fire, and then it decays at some point. So let's stop thinking about timber for a little second, and, and think instead about a different material. So let's think about concrete. 
and what happens on the decay phase of a fire. So if we look at concrete and we look at its strength profile as a function of temperature, so temperature along the bottom, residual strength in a fire up the left-hand side. It looks something like this. Um, that's what concrete does. So below about 100 degrees doesn't do very much from a strength point of view. And up to 300 Celsius, it's lost a little bit, but really not very much. Then it starts dropping off a little bit more rapidly, above 300, 400 Celsius, in terms of the, the residual strength. Then if we look at, a, a, say, a slab of concrete up at the top right-hand corner there, and we think about the temperatures that a piece of concrete gets to in a fire. So time along the bottom there, and then uh, temperature up the left-hand side. And so if we look at the surface of a piece of concrete, then that's pretty much going to track the temperature of the, of the fire itself. It's going to get very hot, um, uh, you know, in the order of you know, up to 1,000 Celsius, some, something like that. But if we then look deeper within the concrete, so if we look inside the concrete, maybe in the center, it's going to be much, much cooler. It's only going to maybe reach somewhere between 1 and 300 degrees. It will depend enormously on the dimensions of the concrete and all of these kind of things. But the important point here is that, first, it's going to be cooler inside. So the concrete doesn't really get affected uh, by those temperatures because, as we can see on the graph on the left-hand side, the concrete doesn't get very hot. Uh, it doesn't lose strength until a little bit higher. But also, those temperatures are reached quite a long time after the end of the fire. So the center of the piece of concrete continues to get hot even after the fire has finished. Now, if we compare that to, well, as, if we compare that to a piece of uh, timber, for example, and again, this is just indicative, but if we look at that piece of timber, the, the temperatures might be even lower in, inside a piece of timber, something like this. But the timber itself loses strength at much lower temperatures than the concrete. The degradation curve on timber looks a little bit like this. So by you know, 100, 125, you've lost maybe more than 50% of the capacity. And by 300, well, it's gone. We know that because we saw that from, our, from a gravimetric analysis. We don't have any timber left by that point because it's burnt. And so, this is really starts to get quite important for the cooling phase. Because what it means is that timber, whereas if we look at a material such as concrete, concrete get, does get hot. It continues to change long after the fire is over. And people don't really tend to think about that very hard. And maybe they should, but maybe they've been able to get away with that. Because concrete doesn't really lose its strength uh, until temperatures that are a bit above what we're seeing in the core. Whereas with timber, it loses its strength much, much earlier. So we need to think about it. We need to think what happens when the core of my CLT reaches one of these temp which reaches these kind of temperatures. And so a little example of this. Um, so this is a, a project in Norway. I believe this is the world's uh, world's tallest uh, uh, all timber building at the moment. Although, as I mentioned, that that seems to change every week at the moment. Um, but obviously, you can see it's a very impressive uh, structure. And what, the, uh, what these guys did as, as part of this project was they did some fire testing. So they did some furnace testing on the glue lamb um, columns that were inside uh, uh, the structure. And what they, uh, what they did is they ran their furnace test. They ran it for, I think, 90 minutes. And then they turned the furnace off and then took the, took the column out. But they, they measured very, they, they instrumented the, uh, the test very well. Um, and so they had firmacouples or in, inside, the, inside the element. So they were able to track the temperatures. And what they demonstrated is that the, the column was able to resist the applied load for the 90-minute fire resistance test. Mm -hmm. But then one of my colleagues at uh, the University of Edinburgh, Felix uh, Weissner, so thank, uh, I'll thank him for this, he, uh, he ran those numbers um, not just stopping at 90 minutes, but continued all the way through the data logging period. And so for the first 90 minutes, we had a degradation in the, uh, the crushing capacity. But as I say, that was enough to resist the design load. When Felix ran the numbers for, uh, for longer, he demonstrated that the column only had, after about 270 minutes, 13% of its original capacity. So 
what we've got here is a material that's continuing to degrade long after the fire is finished to the point where it's no longer necessarily able to bear the applied load. Now, what's important to remember about this is that our guidance documents, so if you go and look at ADB, um, doesn't regulate the decay phase. The, the standard fire resistance test doesn't have a decay phase, it just heats it. So we never need look at this. And as I say, for, for concrete structures, perhaps we should, but maybe we've been getting away with it, although there's some notable cases where people would suggest that failures did occur because on cooling. And then it's also worth bearing in mind that if you're designing a structure and you're designing in accordance with Eurocode 5, that also does not address the hazard presented by cooling because it stops at the end of your fire. So again, you know, I'm not just here to present problems to you, present solutions as well. So I like my uh, Brexit terminology uh, at the moment. So I'll call it the structural backstop. If we manage to get through the fire, we decide we're not going to encapsulate and we get our decay phase and we successfully get a burnout because we've solved the energy balance or we tested it uh, and we satisfied ourselves. At the end, what we have to do is we have to make sure we have sufficient capacity to go through that cooling phase as well. Because otherwise, again, we can't rely on that prolonged evacuation period. We cannot uh, have a stay put policy and we cannot guarantee our firefighter safety. So that pretty much brings me towards the end of what I wanted to, uh, to present to you guys today. So I've made a few statements. So table A2 cannot be assumed to apply to this kind of building. Statement two is that the functional requirement must be addressed directly. And statement three is that for these kind of buildings where we're building them tall and we want to have prolonged evacuation stay put and we want to guarantee firefighter safety, those buildings we need to design for burnout. But I've also provided some ideas here, some solutions. As I say, I don't take credit for them. Some of these are, you know, these, these are not new. Solution one is to avoid the problem by encapsulating the timber. Solution two is to do the work, solve the energy balance, demonstrate it works. Test, uh, solution three is to test every single solution, every single proposal that we're going to have. And lastly, once we do all of that stuff, we have to have our structural backstop to make sure that the structure does not fail during the decay phase. So I'd like to just acknowledge the people who helped me uh, put together this uh, talk. And then I guess uh, we have time for uh, questions or for discussion.